good golly, Miss Lo- uh, you know, Devil with a Blue Dress on. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, as the piece evolved, you will see it. Korean drum dancer and Allen Ginsberg chanting and then a Navajo woman singing Navajo chants. And uh, <clears throat> in each case, it was uh, as hyperbolic as you can imagine. But the point of the piece <clears throat> was <clears throat> uh, to create this model for what uh, this kind of TV landscape of the future would look like. Uh, you know, when, again, with my students, they would say, what's TV Guide and what's the Manhattan telephone book? <laughs> I mean, it's interesting how quickly references that you think were like everlasting references would just completely fade away. <clears throat> but uh, Pike used this, these, these programs as software for installations because he knew if you were going to put this material into an art museum, that the art museum context was not a place <clears throat> where people were uh, comfortable or n- normally uh, predisposed to sit and watch television. In fact, today, one of the problems with video (coughs) in museums is that uh, all time-based art has a problem with the kind of frame of reference that most non-sophisticated visitors to art museums have uh, when they go into an art museum, which is to say they want to walk through a space, look at a lot of pictures on the wall, have a snack, buy a souvenir, and leave. They didn't really think about investing four hours of sitting in a dark room. (coughs) <coughs> and watching television. And in fact, most video art that was made for single channel playback uh, failed in that very respect because television wasn't really <coughs> uh, at home in the art museum except as, <coughs> as an extension of sculptural practice. And Pike knew that. <coughs> I mean, Pike made later in his career all sorts of video sculptures like this one, which uh, he always said, fish need to fly on the ceiling, so I'll make them fly on the ceiling. So he'd make psychedelic images of fish and attach all the monitors to the ceiling. <coughs> or this great piece, which is in the collection of the Smithsonian Museum of American Art, where he made a map of the United States, and then in each, and in each area he would make video from that off the air uh, or kind of hyperbolic video about these various parts and, uh, of, of the United States. Um, but <laughs> this is the, the thing of Nam June's that really always captured my attention. And this was a print, it's a bad reproduction of a print that he made uh, for a portfolio that was produced uh, by a group of artists uh, on, uh, to to raise funds for an exhibition that Pontus Hultain had organized for the Moderna Musique in Stockholm in 1972. Uh, and it was an exhibition that had Bob Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns and, <clears throat> and a lot of the artists who were part of the uh, experiments in art and technology movement, and Nam June was in it. And to raise money for this show, which was actually kind of done as a peace offering between American art community and the Swedish art community at a time when the U.S. and Sweden had actually broken diplomatic relations over the Vietnam War. So it was like artists taking uh, a step to try to just establish their own communications with, uh, with, a, with a community of artists uh, that they hoped to be able to relate to. And so uh, Pike made this wonderful work. And it was basically a collage made from a Life magazine advertisement from the very uh, last months of the Second World War. So it's like in late 1944. And as you see, the ad says, do you know how many television sets will, uh, will be in most homes? How many small packages, blah, blah, blah. Do you, <clears throat> you know, and Pike added to this, um, and of course I love the TV set of the future there that these people are looking at because it, it's like a little, a little postage stamp attached to a radio. <clears throat> um, but Pike says, how long, how soon will the TV chair be available in most museums, which you know was an idea of his, um, the TV chair here, as a TV chair. He said, "Oh, input and output has to be in balance." It was more of a TV toilet than a TV chair. But then he said, "How soon will artists have their own TV channels?" And that's a pretty prescient question. How soon will artists have their own TV channels, and how soon will <coughs> how soon will wall-to-wall TV for video art be installed in most homes? Uh, you know, pretty interesting questioning for, uh, for, uh, for, a, um, for an artist working at, at that moment in time. And it, this, this image and this work always remained in my mind, even though, you know, Pike did create this, this great TV chair, I think a very, another version of it. <clears throat> because for all of the work that Pike did subsequent throughout his career until 
he, uh, the stroke kind of incapacitated him and they eventually died from complications of that stroke. But for all those years, Pike's work was devoted and directed towards a very specific thing, uh, which was how do we move past an antiquated notion of not just a video as art, because like Walter Benjamin's uh, well-asked question uh, uh, about the nature of photography, which was what? It's not whether or not photography is art, but how has photography changed all social structures, all social life? How has it changed how we define what art is? Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in an analogous way, what Pike was asking in his work was not that television should be taken seriously as an art form or that video art should be accepted into the canon, because uh, he could care less about the canon. And quite frankly, he was right not to care about the canon because the, the notion of the canon was, in a way, what was wrong. What Pike was saying was, you know, how will changes in technology affect the way in which all of our social relationships, including those that are, that <laughs> are connected to what we call art as a cultural construction, uh, how, will, how has television already changed that and how will new technologies that are uh, that are on the horizon, like those that even as early as 72 he could predict, like wall-sized TV or every artist having their own TV channel. Again, kind of predicting the internet pretty, pretty effectively. Uh, how, would that, how would that function? So <laughs> Pike continued to work that way. But for the most part, most artists and the best artists of this time um, saw video as, you know, uh, an extension of their sketch pad, or as an extension of their ability to explore uh, ontological issues. Uh, and coming as it did at the, uh, in parallel to the rise of conceptual art, you know, artists like Bruce Nauman, uh, you know, um, where are we here? Have I lost, have I lost control? Something's happened here. I actually hate technology, but uh, it'll, it'll, it'll behave eventually, or it won't. Hello? Oh, there we go. It'll probably now race through 10 slides. Oh, there we go. Can we go back? We can go forward. So, you know, Nauman, uh, working in Los Angeles in, in 1967, um, and who was very interested in, in his body as, a, uh, as an extension of sculpture and as a subject of sculpture, as both the object and subject of his work, interested in dance, interested in, in uh, as Ros Rosalind Krauss wrote about, uh, that, that kind of relationship between sculpture and not sculpture and architecture and not architecture, what happens in the middle. And Nauman was <coughs> really interested in exploring that. And although photography was one way and holography was one way and neon offered him another way, video offered him one way uh, that allowed him to really also uh, think about the kind of phenomenological issues <coughs> that, that were raised by conceptual art. Uh, and uh, like in this video card or piece, uh, where uh, uh, where he created a, you know a very narrow space, put a, a video camera in it, in which as you navigated the space as an as an individual, you both perceived yourself navigating the space and were perceived by others navigating this space. Uh, but uh, let's see if this one is going to work. <clears throat> or, or this piece here, which is really from one, from uh, really one of the great works of, of Nauman's from the time. Hard to again uh, see this from a simple slide, uh, and of course that's the problem of, of any conversation about video or video installation is that seeing a slide, seeing one image, it's you know it, it's it's ridiculous. But I can. Uh, but I can tell you that this work, which uh, allowed for the uh, imagination of a space that you couldn't see, but you knew existed because of the way he constructed uh, a closed room and an open room identical, that allowed, that uh, enforced you to recognize the potential of a space existing that you couldn't 
that you couldn't see. Nauman saw in video the idea of being able to explore those kinds of ontological issues and those kind of uh, phenomenological issues. And, uh, and of course, when he made these works in 1967 and 68, no one was interested. No one. And in fact, the only one who was interested, even though now Leo Castelli was trying to show his work in New York and Nick Wilder in Los Angeles, no reviews, no, no one talking about it. But this one kind of really cagey Italian collector from Milan showed up in New York and said, yeah, I think, uh, how about if, Leo, how about if I buy all of this from you? I'll give you $1,000 for this one. And that was Giuseppe Ponza di Bumo. And so most of this work wound up in the Ponza collection because Ponza was the first one to think, I may not understand what this is, but I think this is really going to be important. And so Ponza, Ponza then wound up uh, giving and selling a lot of this work to the, the Guggenheim and Moke in Los Angeles. So now it's uh, uh, wonderfully in public collections and people can see it when it's installed, but unlike painting and sculpture, these works are rarely installed because they're so space consuming and difficult to install uh, that most people only hear about them. Uh, and yet, they've done their job. They, as, you know, as pioneering sculpture, they push the idea that this extended eye, this, this extended memory that the videotape was, this extended eye that the video camera was, could be employed uh, to explore issues of space and time in ways that you couldn't using more traditional materials. Uh, this is, uh, you know, one of his more recent works, which is actually Fat Chance, uh, which was a piece that he did for Dia, uh, dedicated to John Cage, which uh, uh, followed up in his continuing interest in what happens in a studio. This is a five-hour piece that uh, was recorded with infrared camera at night where you watched uh, his cat chase mice in the studio at night. It's an amazing piece. Sounds boring, but it's actually <laughs> riveting. <clears throat> and he did video installations like, you know, uh, uh, like this one here, which is, uh, you know, a... Um, a piece from 1974, uh, employing actors, again, acting out kind of simple scripts. Uh, he produced video sculptures like this with, uh, uh, with a wax head and a, and, a, and a video of a finger uh, and, uh, you know, where the hand would then rotate under the stationary wax head. And so uh, Nauman, for 30 years, has used video in a way that many artists of his generation has, as a tool of sculpture. And that, it makes complete sense, you know, to be able to use memory, to be able to use the extended eye, the extended memory, uh, the image that has so much cultural baggage that can be interestingly reused in a, a sculptural uh, framework. Uh, and, uh, you know, that work continues to inspire. But again, Nauman worked within the framework of the art world. The work rarely spoke beyond that. There were a few works, uh, Good Boy, Bad Boy, and Clown Torture, that, that had implications beyond that. But generally speaking, the work stayed in that world. Uh, similarly, Peter Campus, a New York-based artist, this is a work from a, an exhibition I did at the Everson in 1973 uh, <clears throat> called Optical Sockets. Uh, this is, uh, there's Optical Sockets installed again in London in 2005. Uh, a piece, uh, a, a, another piece called Kiva in the front. We we'll see another image of uh, of a simple video installation of of campuses from a recent show. This is called a Portrait of a Man with Death on His Mind. Uh, and so, Campus immediately recognized that for him, video was interesting as a way of looking at psychological issues. He was trained in experimental psychology, and most of his work dealt with, the, uh, this, uh, with issues of perception and issues of, uh, of, um, uh, of cognition. Uh, in this work here, for instance, the viewer would stand and in, in, walk into a space. They'd see themselves, uh, you know, as, again, Rosalind Krauss talked about in the aesthetics of narcissism, nothing, uh, nothing uh, makes a visitor in a gallery space happier than to see themselves. <clears throat> projected on a wall, and it often just freezes you there. But while you're standing there looking at yourself, another image of yourself taken by another camera on the side floats into the space and then just starts floating away. And, you know, you, you have this kind of very strange body feeling in your chi, you know, here, you know, like, all of a sudden you got this sense of, of this disem disembodied part of you from a point of view that you can't even 
see. It's not like seeing yourself in a mirror. It's not like Kanye in that sense. It's, it's uncanny to see yourself float like that. And, and, and Campus produced a number of pieces like that. Again, here, this is a, a close-up of that piece, Kiva, where a simple uh, camera uh, w was focused through a small hole in a, in a, in a uh, front-sided mirror. <clears throat> and the mirror would sometimes hit a small mirror hanging directly behind that hole. And the image would be just, uh, you might be standing in front of it, and you would only see the mirror images of the space around you, but if those mirrors aligned themselves uh, uh, tangentially to the camera, all of a sudden you would be there, or your image would then start floating around. So again, these formal devices that campus produced were only relevant within a gallery context, and campus understood that, even though he was very famous for producing some single channel works um, uh, in which he used some of these same tricks and would get these works put on broadcast television and public television. The real interest for campus, as for most serious artists of this time, was to make use in a direct way of the gallery space. Again, this is a 1974 piece, another piece from, I love the size of that video projector there, you know, it's like, it looks like a jet engine. But that was state of the art in 1973 black and white video projector. In fact, I wish we could find one again because it actually produced black and white video. You know, today you can't look at real black and white. It's always kind of got a colored tinge to it. Like, that's kind of like green and black and white or something. And this piece here uh, is a, this is an image of a, of a performance that I participated in just two weeks ago at the Tate in their new, uh, in their new, um, turb in the new halls in the gas tanks. And it's actually a recreation of a work that the Chilean uh, sculptor and architect Juan Downey produced with me in 1973 called Plato Now, in which a, nine of us uh, sat on a pedestal just like this with headphones on and with uh, EEG readers uh, taped to our heads um, and back then this was a very complicated thing to do because this EEG reader was uh, attached to a triggering device that would trigger uh, excerpts from Plato's cave dialogues if you were able to produce alpha waves and meditate. And meanwhile, we were just seeing our shadows just like Plato was talking about. And uh, we would be the only ones hearing this Plato's dialogue. The audience was just watching a group of strange looking people with headphones on. <clears throat> and so um, uh, we did this one night in 1972. The Tate wonderfully managed to uh, recruit a, a, an entire crew of serious meditators in the London area to participate in this piece. And they kept it going for a full week. And they invited me to come in the, uh, for the first run of them, and so there I am, kind of the white-haired guy in the middle there, and the only one not getting any alpha waves, but I didn't let them, <laughs> I, I didn't let on. I said, oh yeah, it was so great to hear that Play-Doh again. It was really <laughs> wonderful, but all these other guys like, you know, yeah, namaste, you know, it's like, fine. Uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a great example, again, of using video, not only in a sculptural way, but in a performative way, and many, uh, choreographers and dancers understood that video allowed for a different kind of feedback, a different kind of notation, choreographic notation, obviously a different kind of documentation because uh, dancers could rarely document their work. You know, how much would it cost in 16 or even Super 8 film to document an entire dance performance if you were kind of a, a downtown dancer? And, and how many of these three-minute Super 8 things could you shoot without, without losing the continuity of the piece. All of a sudden, dancers or performance artists could put a 60-minute videotape on a reel and actually get an active uh, document of the work. And by the way, those video documents have been critical to uh, the history of, of late 20th and 21st century choreography. And to the scholarship in choreography, it's been amazing to be able to look back <clears throat> at works that Trisha Brown or Twyla Tharp or, uh, you know, uh, David Gordon or any number of choreographers and dancers have done over the last 30 years is, is unbelievable because that just didn't exist before that. You just had, again, still photographs and, and written recollections and sometimes musical scores 
uh, or choreographic scores written in, in traditional musical format, but there was no way of really doing it. <clears throat> and for performance, its history would be completely lost without that. But again, this is all internal. This is all what, we, what they call in America inside baseball. You know, this is all art, art world stuff for the art world, for art historians. It did not reach out. It did not do <clears throat> what we all hoped and believed uh, video uh, could do or what artists could do. And of course, for me, you know, although I was gaining my education and becoming completely fascinated and enchanted with this world that I'd stumbled into and been embraced by, and I have no complaints, but I, every once in a while I would step back and say, you know, I always thought the art world wasn't political enough, and this is still not really doing it for me. You know, we're still talking to the same one zip code, little white audience of white people who come to art museums and already think nice liberal thoughts and have nothing to do with uh, any, any serious idea of change uh, on any level. It wasn't bringing more people to the table. It wasn't expanding the way in which we told the story. It was doing really interesting things to the history of sculpture, to the history of painting, to the history of dance, or the history of poetry. Even many poets took to video. Filmmakers, they were pretty antagonistic. <laughs> you know, up until fairly recently, most serious filmmakers thought video was like, you know, the devil's work. This was gonna destroy what they cared about so much, this kind of pure, beautiful cinema image, you know, presented in this pure social sp space uh, that had so much revolutionary imp implication that came from the, <clears throat> from the earliest years of the 20th century and were tied to notions of revolution on the most basic level. How could these upstart creeps dis you create these horrible gray and white images that people watch on these terrible television sets? Ugh, I hated it. I mean, Hollis Frampton, I thought he was going to choke me to death once when we had to do a, a, a public conversation about film and video. He just, he, he, his hatred was like palpable. And, uh, you know, I was like, it's like not my fault. You know, I, I think what's happening is kind of interesting. But filmmakers, especially experimental filmmakers of the Frampton and Sharitz generation, they, they really hated what was happening in this medium because they, they saw it as not political in ways that they saw their work as tied to a revolutionary impetus. Uh, Downey was also very political as a Chilean, as a Chilean from the Pinochet, anti-Pinochet, you know, uh, movement from, you know, uh, uh, oops, what have I done here? Um, uh, Downey struggled to find a way to make video relevant uh, and in fact invented a wonderful program called Video Trans Americas where he and his family uh, outfitted a van starting in about 1974 and drove all the way from uh, the Pacific Northwest down into Central America, uh, stopping in small towns along the way, making video, showing it to people in the next town. And that happened all the way actually into, uh, into South America, into Venezuela, where he ended up in the uh, rainforests of Venezuela with the, uh, with the uh, Yanomami people. And so it's starting in Seattle and ending in the Yanam with the Yanomami people in the or along the Orinoco River. He created this network with a van. Again, there was no other way of networking, but Downey decided the only way for him to work out of this framework, work outside of the museum, was to create his own pseudo network, uh, which used gasoline and a and a van, and his own family, and the natural curiosity of people seeing uh, from one town to another very simple documents of day-to-day of -day life. Uh, you know, there were wonderful artists like Joan Jonas uh, making, uh, uh, you know, uh, performance works like, uh, like this work here. No, it's not called Help. Let's see if this works. It's really tiresome, isn't it, doing this this way? It's going to work. Now we just have to find how we get over there. Okay. And this is Joan Jonas' work, Vertical Roll, which she took the. <coughs> What would happen to a television set when it was broken? 
and use it as a, as a structure for a, for a performance piece. We call this a dance work. Is it a theater work? She was interested in this blur between those categories. You know, it, the piece is not entertaining, but it is engaging. And you know, it's, a, it's actually quite a long piece. It's a 30-minute uh, uh, performance uh, in which Joan begins to explore a number of the characters that she, she evolved over the years and has that made use of in her far more complex narrative uh, works, which she very quickly realized had to be done within the frameworks of installations, that just to make a single channel video was not uh, did not ena enable her to explore the, the notions of narrative uh, that she that uh, uh, and uh, that that were of interest to her. And uh, I I hope some of you have had an opportunity to see some of her work. The great piece that she made here in Iceland, Volcano, Volcano Saga, is really uh, it was really an amazing piece. But uh, the pieces she's done in the last two documentaries have really established uh, her work and her ability to, to understand how video could be used not only in this kind of a situation where people are loath to sit for 30 minutes in a in a darkened room to watch a, a videotape, but will sit easily for an hour to watch a performance that has video in it as a prop or as an extension or as a, a, as a way in which in, uh, a different point of view of the performance and the performer or a different attitude about the passage of time within the performance is made available. <laughs> this is uh, a, um, an image from, from Joan's Organic Honey. <clears throat> and there's another image of her for the first time performing organic honey and you can see how the monitor then uh, remained uh, was like another actor on stage uh, and so she could be a solo performer but have uh, essentially something that would act as a prop and an actor and of course you know one of the first people to understand uh, the 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 ways in which television could be used to mimic um, the, but the, both the pace and, the, and the, the, the attitude of commercial television was Bill Wegman. And, you know, Wegman made a series of very short pieces, very much like pencil sketches, uh, in his studio in, in Santa Monica in 1971 through 76. You know, uh, we all know uh, the singing stomach or... Uh, uh, this, of course, piece is a piece that has particular resonance to me because... Um, uh, uh, when Bill made this, he had just visited me on, when I was living on a street called Beach Street. And he, this is Bill with his dog, Man Ray. And Man Ray and Bill lived near the beach. And whenever the word beach would be spoken, the dog would just go crazy, thinking he was going to be taken out to the beach. And so Bill had this idea of a piece called The Spelling Lesson, which... Hey, where is it? I thought I had that. Oh, Mom? Mom? I think Randy's gonna be sick. Let's start this one over. This is before this. Oh, Mom? Mom? I think Randy's gonna be sick. So Bill understood slap the P A R K was spelled correctly. And that was good. Wait a And you spelled uh, O-U-T right. But when it came to beach, you spelt it B-E-E-C-H, which is like the, uh, well, there's a gum called beach nut gum. But the correct spelling is, we meant beach like the sand. 
So it's, it should have been like the ocean. B, B, A, C, H. See, that's the difference. Well, okay, I forgive you. But remember it next time. Okay, next time. So Wegman, you know, Wegman understood, you know, the idea of making these videos very short. Uh, so when we when we show videos at the Everson Museum in our little video gallery, which was like 15 foot by 15 foot with a couple of chairs in it, people actually felt really comfortable watching Bill's pieces because they sort of looked like late night TV ads or something, or like really low rent uh, TV shows. But the the humor was there and. And of course, it didn't make too much of a demand on your attention, as opposed to Bruce Nauman doing a slow angle walk for 60 minutes back and forth on an angle. People couldn't quite understand why they were supposed to watch that. And of course, Bruce never intended people to sit for 60 minutes. He th thought that anybody who would sit down and watch for 60 minutes him walking an angled uh, camera from, uh, uh, on television were insane. He saw that as a sculpture that was really about the gravity, the implicit gravity of it. But when people saw television, they thought, oh, television, sit down, watch TV. This is boring. Video, this is, what is this? I don't like it. But Wegman understood that, you know, this piece, again, with the alarm clock. Another person who understood video in a, in a very interesting way was the architect and theoretical writer and artist uh, Dan Graham. And Dan, uh, very early on in 1972, uh, explored what uh, a number of people, Frank Gillette being uh, another who was very important at this point doing the same thing, exploring the notion of time delay. Uh, and visual time delay is very different than audio time delay. Because when you see yourself in real time, a term that kind of developed around this period, and when you see yourself delayed simultaneously, it creates a very interesting kind of frisson. And like you, Campus understood that as well. Peter Campus understood that as well in his work. Uh, from, <coughs> from Dan Graham's point of view, it wasn't just about uh, an understanding. It was that he saw then time becoming potentially an architectural element. How could an architect make use of time using this video camera and its ability to manipulate memory? And uh, I mean, was, look quickly at I don't even know why we're doing this, but here, we'll look at it. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, Graham, Graham understood that Im the implications of, of, uh, of human behavior in relationship to that kind of, uh, that kind of visibility. <clears throat> there's, another, there's an image of Graham himself uh, posed in, in, in this time delay piece. But Graham also uh, understood the sociology of television viewing and in, in the 90s made a series of works using these kind of glass panels, creating these kind of um, reflective and refractive uh, kind of mini pavilions with pillows in which he would play other artists' videos or in which museums could fill with content from other artists. So it was kind of an interesting, very generous thing to do, although some artists would say, why are you framing my work <laughs> with your work? But from his perspective, he was creating a, a, a space for museums to show many of these videotapes that they were acquiring by artists in a, in a way that was very low key and living room like or loft like where you would just sit on a pillow and watch someone else's videos. So he became the go-to guy for video curators who you know, wanted to create an installation but didn't have the budget to do it so you could just get Dan Graham piece and all of a sudden you had something that was, <clears throat> that was approved. You know. Now, um, 
my old studio mate and pal Bill Viola, uh, of course, has distinguished himself in the production of video installations over the years. <clears throat> at, but at first, he was producing, uh, as he was, like I, uh, kind of a student of Namjoon Pike and of Peter Campus. Uh, uh, he was producing single channel works, again, trying to deal with issues of, of, of the psychology of perception, issues of time. He produced this work uh, um, here in 1979 um, as a single channel tape, and then eventually he re repurposed it as a projection. Uh, and in this piece here, which I won't show in its, uh, at all, actually, because it's really hard to see it in this, this level of, uh, of definition, uh, the, the, the screen is actually uh, indistinguishably constructed into, into an upper and bottom half, and the top half of the picture moves in real time, and the bottom half of the picture moves, uh, in the bottom half of the picture, two weeks goes by. But you, you don't sense that distinction for quite some time. Uh, and you start to see within one frame the potential for coexisting notions of time. Uh, and those kind of ideas began to seep into Viola's consciousness uh, to the point where he realized that the only kind of work he would make that would allow him to really explore those ideas uh, much more fully than he could by making single channel videos was by making installations. This is a piece that he made called The Greeting and at this point, he was now working with, uh, in 1995, uh, with um, uh, seriously good video cameras. And, and this piece, uh, using slow motion, uh, was an allegory of, uh, uh, of, the, of the Annunciation. Uh, and um, when it was shown at the Venice Biennale that year, uh, people, for the, it, it, people for the first time saw that the video image if properly produced and properly manipulated, could produce an extraordinarily powerful um, and moving experience uh, when you could look in great detail at the passage of time and at minute changes that could occur in time dealt with in a, in a fully um, sculptural way. Uh, in this piece here, uh, The Passing, which, uh, uh, which many people may recall, that's one side the man is drenched with water. The other side of the man is consumed by fire. <clears throat> it's a 20-foot video installation set up in a room about the same size. Uh, again, a piece of enormous power, but it could only be done within this framework. Again, artists recognizing that the museum provided a framework for a certain kind of sculptural exploration, but not more than that. Uh, this is a piece he did for the, uh, called The Messenger for uh, the Cathedral in Durham uh, on the English and Scottish border. Uh, it, it, you know, uh, and it was the first work commissioned by this cathedral in many hundred years and sits on the, uh, the uh, west wall of this cathedral. And it, 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 it was recognized for having great you know, spiritual potential, even though Bill didn't really see it as a, a religious work. Again, looking at body floating in water as this one does and, 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 and resolving itself out of the water in some ways was recognized as a kind of a, an allegory to the resurrection and brought into this, even though it was a nude figure and that was somewhat controversial in the city of Durham to have a fully frontal nude man uh, present in, in the cathedral. Uh, it's still a work that now by today has become deeply loved by the people of that community. And this is a piece he did at the Deutsche Guggenheim, where he, uh, he produced uh, four <coughs> very large scale, very complex uh, works uh, to be seen in, in, one, in, one, uh, in one large gallery space. The production costs of this work alone were close to a million dollars. So by this point, video installations, video production had become so sophisticated, it was rivaling the cost of feature films and demanding the kind of patronage and, and, uh, and support uh, that had very little to do with the, with the initial uh, idea of, of Pike and that generation of, of artists and that generation of, of alternative journalists and documentary makers who in the late 60s saw video as, as an alternative form. But on the, at the same time, uh, video was succeeding in an enormous fashion in changing the ways in which we understood that sculpture or painting could function uh, in, in large-scale public spaces. 
Again, another uh, video installation of violas. Uh, this is a very small-scale video installation of violas called Heaven and Earth, uh, not projected. We're seeing it outside the room here. Here's, this is two uh, stripped-down television tubes uh, mounted this way, one on top of the other, and in the bottom tube is an image in black and white video of, of the artist's mother in coma uh, just days before she died, and in the top screen, uh, also in dark black and white, is an image of his son, newly born, who his mother never lived to see. And so these images mix in the reflection here. And this was, a, a, again, a really beautiful, very moving, very powerful work of art that could only exist as a video sculpture. It could, only it could not exist as a broadcast piece. It could not exist in, in any kind of theatrical set, setting. It was uh, television understood for its sculptural qualities. Another image of that work. Maybe you get a close-up of it. <clears throat> then you have an artist like Dara Birnbaum, whose interest in popular culture, and especially in the, in the image of women in popular culture, was uh, very important uh, work in the mid-'70s, uh, relating to you know, a, a kind of a critical rereading of popular television, commercial television. Um, this is a work she produced based on, uh, on, a, uh, on a television show about the cartoon character Wonder Woman, um, and which she appropriated. And so this is also seen within the framework of the history of that, that aspect of conceptualism that we unfairly call appropriation, uh, in which she appropriated this clip of, uh, of Wonder Woman caught in this hall of mirrors. Uh, down, right is left. meeting like this. Come on.
it's a wonderful piece, actually. I, but of course, Birnbaum didn't just show this as a single channel video. She constructed a, a, a complex sculptural environment in which this uh, kind of early music video piece, and this was produced in 1978 when uh, MTV was still just kind of an idea. In fact, they employed Dara to create uh, what they called art breaks at that time because, you know, here she was, <coughs> you know, really using this material in a way, uh, in, you know, the sample, almost that predicted sampling uh, that would be done much more easily in digital times uh, and creating this kind of wonderful poem about the, uh, the kind of complex confusion of identities, uh, you know, within a kind of a framework of feminism projected within this commercial framework. It was a, it's a great, it's still a great work, I think, retains its power today, but she knew that she couldn't just produce it within, uh, as a single channel video piece. It had to be done within a sculptural environment that added many more layers uh, to, uh, of meaning to the work. Come on. Uh, and this is a, an installation of a, a current installation of a, of a work that she did on the damnation of Faust. And then of course, you know, there were poets like Vito Conchi who, uh, again, saw video as a way of moving off of the page, which was, as a, as a poet, was his interest. He wanted to leave the page, leave the room, leave the desk, get out into the world, uh, engage in social relationships in a way that began what you see as an arc from him as a poet to his present identity as an architect. But video for him was a, was a way out of that, the, that relationship um, to, the, uh, to the written word and to the printed page and in this case, he was able to, in this work called Undertone, uh, create this, this work which is both making use of television's inherent intimacy. Was, this was never meant to be shown, for instance, theatrically like this. This was always meant to be shown on a small monitor that you would see singularly in a gallery uh, with one chair in front of it. So here we're completely misusing this work, but let's misuse it for a second. Because it, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful work in which uh, Akanchi's, I think I have this figured out now, spoke too soon. I'm not going to go through all of it, but and I hope you've all had a chance to see that at some point. Oh. No, stop. Okay. Uh, but Akanji understood and played with the notion of this, the inherent intimacy of television as opposed to the kind of theatrical and social space of, of the cinema or of the theater. With any number of works like this work as well, which he kind of identifies you in the audience pointing piece. Uh, and of course, you know, this is his infamous work, Seedbed. Um, in which he positioned himself under the floor in the Sonnabin Gallery. And then in an attempt to kind of uh, become one with the floor, 
uh, masturbated under the floor while people walked above him. But Akanchi also realized that these videos, the video documents and the video tapes he made, uh, did not work, again, when they were placed in a museum context. They only worked in this kind of strange world of people being able to see a videotape in a small, intimate space. And so, for instance, for this work here called uh, Teller World, which is in the collection of the Guggenheim, he created this kind of architectural space, this, uh, this kind of structural and uh, sculptural environment for the pr presentation of a, s a whole series of video works. <coughs> This is a, a video installation work by Marina Abramovich and Ulai, where they took a, a video that they produced uh, when the two of them were still working uh, together deep, uh, closely. And, uh, and it mimicked, through all the cabling and connections, their relationship, but it had to be placed in a sculptural environment. That's another, there's a more recent Marina Abramovich uh, video from the uh, pieces where she was um, uh, dealing with notions of death and, and destruction and war. Uh, this is a piece by a, a young New York artist named Sue DeBeer. Again, a video installation with a bed and a two-screen video projection. Uh, uh, again, uh, with a complex narrative that was only ex uh, <coughs> expanded by the presence of these sculptural objects and the narrative video. Uh, here's a classic example of a great video installation that could only be seen in, the, in, a, in a projection work, and this is uh, Shira Nishat's uh, extraordinary work from 2006. Um, and, and this is a, uh, a multiple video work, multiple monitor video work by, uh, by the New York artist Lorna Simpson. Uh, this is uh, a video installation work by the English uh, 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 sisters. Um, I'm blanking their names. Louise and yes, right, the Wilson sisters. Uh, and here is, of course, a Matthew Barney video installation. Now, you say, well, is the video the most important component of this work, or is it just one other prop in this work in which he, uh, he created these enormously complex uh, 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 films around these, uh, these dense narratives and then repurposed them within these video installations and that, that were then sold to museums and collectors in order to pay for the, for the film. But they each work had their, its own weight and, and, in, uh, and in Barney's sense they all have equal value to him, the cinema work as well as the sculptural installations making use of the cinema and the props that were part of the film. Of course, here is uh, uh, one of my favorite installations of Douglas Gordon's 24-Hour Psycho, uh, in which he reproduced the Hitchcock film, slowed down so that the, re represent, re the replaying of Psycho literally takes 24 hours. Uh, and in this case, he actually uh, had it going from front to back on one screen and back to front on the other, which was kind of an interest, the only time he ever tried that. Um, another Douglas Gordon. Here's the shower scene. Many people waited hours and hours to be able to see the shower scene. Of course, it took, it took about 45 minutes to watch this shower scene, which is kind of interesting if that's what you were interested in. Uh, um, uh, this uh, video installation work uh, 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 by uh, the um, Los Angeles artist, whose name I'm flanking on right now, uh, but again, you can see how much more how much more complex and you know and demanding of space and uh, and, uh, and 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 energy these works have become. Uh, this is a Doug Aiken piece from the Whitney, uh, Biennial in 1997. Uh, this is Doug Aiken's piece done outside uh, at the Museum of Modern Art a couple of years ago, using you know Hollywood stars and, and producing a kind of a public using public space for the representation of video. Not exactly broadcast, but actually seen by many, many people in ways that, you know, change their idea of, of television. Uh, this is uh, a Ryan Tricartan piece, a young artist who's, again, used a video with, to create these complex sculptural environments has, has, has made him a kind of a leading character of his generation. And of course, uh, this is one of my favorite works by Christian Markley, which is Video Quartet. Uh, in which he, uh, this is before he made the clock, uh, went and uh, created an amazingly, beautifully scored musical work that he did on his own Mac computer uh, on four screens. There's another image from it. 
24-hour work in which every found image of clocks or watches uh, is literally synced to real time in a 24-hour day, and the gallery then has to be open for all those 24 hours for you to explore this relationship between it. And again, in this case, video is merely a collaging format. But it also enables, because of the ability of a, of a massive terabyte hard drive to, to accommodate 24 hours of material to produce something of this kind of complexity and length, you couldn't have done that in any other way. <clears throat> this is a work by Mika Rotenberg. Uh, again, a video installation uh, work um, that uh, demands a certain kind of sculptural presence. Uh, this is work by Paul Chan, a video, uh, video and sh shadow installation work. Uh, this is a, a work by Corey Archangel using uh, the imagery from a video game from Mario Brothers, but without the Mario Brothers, just the clouds. Uh, and then we get to where I think uh, this whole argument takes us, and that is into a world in which the idea of video kind of collapses upon itself. I mean, we can see video has succeeded in many ways. The market has proven in, in its own logic the success of video. A, a Bruce Nauman video installation sells for several million dollars. Bill Viola, the same thing. The, these works are, are coveted by museums and private collectors who now see video as, uh, as part of an important collection of contemporary art. And for whatever we think of that aspect of the art world, I, I don't believe it defines the art world, but it surely is an important component of it. We see that video has succeeded. But in, in ways that I would say Nam Jun Pike would, would, would say if he were alive today, video has failed also, because video has moved further and further away from the potential, the political and ideological implications and potential that video had <coughs> as it began. And so here's a work that was made in 1990. Uh, five by the artist and writer Douglas Davis, and we'll just, this is not a, a live video work, this is a work created for the internet, actually it was created in 1993, I believe, and um, is now owned by the Whitney Museum. It was the very first work that the Whitney <coughs> created, uh, acquired, that was a work produced for the internet. And what the work was is the world's first collaborative sentence. And it was a work that Douglas Davis started with this text here, and a work that continues to this day that anyone can move into, can click into this work and add to it. And so there are literally thousands and thousands of pages of this sentence that cannot stop. The only rule he put into the, into the software here was that you couldn't put a period in. It would not accept an end of a sentence. So other than that, you can do anything. You can see how people, you know, changed typefaces, uh, you know, could create any number of uh, things. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have added to this over the years. And, and what Davis did, and, you know, I don't believe that Davis is a great artist, but he was very close to Nam June also, and really thoughtful uh, character. And what he understood was that it was the internet that held in it the promise that uh, video held out in its early days in 1967. And what that promise was, was the erasure of a line that used to distinguish readers and writers, quite simply. That it, it, there was a point where there were writers, whether they were filmmakers or video makers or, uh, or, or printed uh, writers using printed pages, and then there were the rest of us. We were readers. And it was a privilege to be a reader. In some societies, being a reader was a very hard-won right to be able to read what you want and to be able to have access to that. But what, <clears throat> what Pike understood in the early 70s, what Davis understood here, and what many, many other artists have now understood since then, and I, and I won't go into more details here because I think I'd rather spend some more time hearing from some of you and talking with you rather, rather than continuing to talk at you, is that the erasure, the blurring of that line between writers and readers defined a truly paradigmatic moment in, in the intellectual life on the planet. It wasn't just that the world had now become globally linked, which seems 
to be a rather radical idea. That uh, here in Reykjavik, you could look at work by somebody working in Tokyo, or in Los Angeles, or in Sao Paulo, in real time at any moment. That, as Pike predicted, every artist can have their own channel. It's called your YouTube, or your Vimeo, Vimeo channel, or your own, uh, your own URL, your own address. You might have a hard time getting people to, to know where you are, and to find your channel, but you can have your own channel. And, and that's uh, pretty important. But more important and more subtle and more difficult to absorb, perhaps so difficult to absorb that it may take a generation of artists to understand the true implications of it, is now this erasure of this line. That to be a writer and to be a reader are mutually exchangeable identities. And that you only maintain the authority of the writer when your idea is a better idea. That the idea now got, uh, the idea now empowers the position, the power of being a writer, and that you can you can agree or uh, or even design to give up that position or to share that position. You can create a work in which your authority is never uh, asserted or or in, insisted upon, in which the notion of community and the idea of 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 um, crowdsourced uh, sensibility becomes an, an, an integral part of a work. And that really challenges so much of what we think about how a work of art is constructed, what our job is as an artist, what the role of an institution like a museum or, the, uh, or an internet uh, um, uh, um, access point or even the internet itself is. All of these institutional identities, all these roles that we think we understand are called into question by this simple erasure of this relationship that we, for so many centuries, taken for granted that there were writers and readers. And in a way, uh, I would say, um, let me get out of this for good. Uh, and, you know, this is a piece by Antonio Montales, The File Room, in which, uh, uh, again, I won't go into it now, but I would, if you want to look at it, you can check it out. It has the history of, of, of censorship, and it's being added to all the time by artists producing works that deal with censorship, uh, and as well as documents. Uh, the Whitney Museum found uh, the need to create a place called Artport, so they not only have physical galleries, but now a space where artists who are working within this frame uh, can exhibit their work. Uh, an organization like Rhizome created, now part of the new museum, uh, simply as a, uh, to support the community of artists working in this space. Uh, uh, um, Adobe, the corporation Adobe, created their own museum using their technology. And it, although it's super slick and a little embarrassing, they do amazing things in this kind of corporate uh, digital art museum. Uh, there's this, the super, the super art modern museum called Spam. This French kind of invention has many uh, artists in, uh, in in continental Europe who are producing digital works within it. Uh, <clears throat> the Dia Art Center, since 2003, has produced not only works up in Beacon at their space there or in Manhattan, but they've also provided space for digital artists to produce a wide range of experiments. The Walker Art Center as well. And so here's an image of Namjoon shortly before he died when I went to talk to him about all this. And Namjoon kind of politely flipped me the bird and said, you see, we win. Thank you very much. <laughs>